In this case, I've already mentioned that we'll be using this particular Batman logo. I saw numerous graphics on the internet that showed the evolution of the Batman logo over the decades, and this logo is claimed to be from the 2005 Batman Begins movie, the first of the Christopher Nolan trilogy. Some other graphics show a different logo for that movie, but I don't really care. We're rolling with this one. Even though we will ultimately end up with a single parametric pair of equations, we do need to start the process by thinking of the design as a bunch of separate curves. When the design is symmetric across a horizontal or vertical axis like this, we can just focus on half of it. And in the final step of the process, we'll take care of the symmetry. We see that this half is made up of a couple line segments and a few curvy curves, none of which is too intricate or bizarre. From the very start, you want to immediately be thinking about what kind of curves you'll use to trace it out. To make some decisions about what kind of curves will fit best, get your image into digital form if it's not already, and import it into Desmos, GeoGebra, or whatever graphing software you prefer. I'm gonna go with Desmos here. So I'll import my image. And let's make the image a bit bigger. And I'm going to give it a little bit of translucency here. OK, notice that when the tip of the wing is at coordinates 22, 0, this other vertex lies at around 10, 0. And the tail is at about 0, negative 9. Some of the vertices up here don't land quite as cleanly on grid points, but you'll never get all the vertices to have integer coordinates. And we've scaled the image large enough so that if you just round those coordinates to the nearest integers, it won't distort the design too much. All right, to keep this video from going five hours long, this is one of those times where I need to assume that you're comfortable enough with Algebra 2 or pre-calc skills to apply graphical transformations to the basic curves. I'm going to throw my several individual equations and curves on the screen, expect that they look familiar to you, and keep my comments about them relatively brief. If you're a high school student, maybe this will remind you of a project your teacher once assigned you. Looking at the curves themselves, the first thing you notice is that this set of curves does not fit the design perfectly well but I'm gonna suggest that they are good enough to use as an example in this video. Notice that if I hide the logo image, who's gonna look at that and go, boo, that sucks? Come on, no one's gonna notice that it's not perfect. Looking at the equations, what might throw you off are all those absolute value bars around the X's and those curly braces at the end of each line. If you can overlook those symbols for just a moment, you'll see that these are pretty typical transformations of basic curves. We have a horizontal line here. We have another line here in point-slope form. We have a parabola whose quadratic function is written in vertex form here. This equation, written explicitly, graphs a portion of an ellipse. That's this curve here. If you prefer to write the ellipse equation implicitly, if this format looks more familiar to you, go ahead and write it this way. That's fine. Here we have the equation for a cubic graph. Notice it's a transformation of x equals y cubed, not the more familiar y equals x cubed. That's this curve here. And finally, we have a couple more parabolas whose quadratic functions are written in vertex form. OK, let's use this parabola here. Let's use that parabola to demonstrate what's going on with those absolute value bars and those curly braces. I'll start by just deleting those and making it just our common quadratic and vertex form. Okay, as I zoom out, I see that we really want to address the symmetry of this parabola. I want it to be mirror imaged across the vertical axis. That's what the absolute value bars do. I just take this X, select it, and put some absolute value bars around it and get a symmetric graph now. And I encourage you to really think about it until you're really sure that it makes sense why that works. I notice some of the points on this symmetric graph. Positive 16, 5, negative 16, 5. 
positive 22, 0, negative 22, 0. If I plug, say, positive 16 into this equation, due to the absolute value bars, shouldn't I get the same result as if I plugged in a negative 16? That's what the absolute value bars are doing. Again, they're ensuring that any positive input and its negative will produce the same output, 5 in this case. Alright, so we got the symmetry down, but now we want to trim this curve. I want to restrict its domain. Let me focus on this half first. I want to restrict this curve from x values of 10 up to 22. And that's what the curly braces do. This is a Desmos format. You'll have to check whatever grapher you prefer to figure out how to restrict the domain. In Desmos, that's what the curly braces do. I'll put 10 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 22. All right, if I zoom out, I see that I'm back to having just that portion of curve that has positive x values. To get my symmetry back, I just pull the same trick. I select that x and I put absolute value bars around it. And now x values between negative 22 and negative 10 will also satisfy this compound inequality. So I see on the graph I've got my symmetry back. And in short, that's essentially what I'm doing on all of these equations. Making images out of many transformed functions like this has become a fairly popular assignment in high school math classes in recent years, so this step has not produced anything particularly novel yet, other than possibly adding a bunch more equations and curves for a design with greater detail. That's where a lot of those high school projects end. But not us. We will proceed to start consolidating those seven equations down to a single parametric pair. A quick side note for the uber geeky Batman purists who just can't get past these curves imperfections. I'll quickly show you my more complicated set of curves before we return to the simpler set and proceed with the demonstration. Alright, there's my more complicated set of equations and curves that hug the perimeter of the original design a little more closely. For these curves, instead of sticking exclusively to parabolas and cubics, I toyed with the exponents a little bit. Take this orange curve, for example. Instead of using a quadratic function, I played with the exponent. I made the exponent a slider, h. And you'll notice as I play with the value of h, I find that an exponent value of, an h value of 4, gives me a really nice result here. I did a similar thing with this blue curve down here. Instead of sticking with the quadratic function, I played with the exponent. That exponent I called d, and here's a slider. I see that as I play with the value of d, 2.5 is about as good as I'm going to get. Now I found for this green curve, I just couldn't get a power function in the form of x to the something power to hug the perimeter very closely. So I ended up taking an ellipse, and rotating it in plane, and converting it into parametric form, and doing some fancy trig identities on it. And here is the equation that I ended up with for this green curve. Again, it's parametric, so I'll zoom out a little bit here so you can see the full pair. So I'm just showing that it can be done, and you'll have to decide how much work you want to put into trying to perfect the recreation of the design.